Okay, well, thank you very much. Oh, that was um, so first of all, thank you all for being here. It's been a really pleasure to have you here. And I'm going to ask a couple of questions, uh, but then I'm going to call a few of you, uh, of the Great Construction Lab, my colleagues, uh, to ask a short question. Okay, and the questions are going to go first to Barney, then to Mara, uh, Suzanne, and then to my client. Okay, so you'll each get a short question. Uh, and I'll give you a moment to think about why it's my opening. And so, kind of my uh, question is going to be for you to start. Uh, oh. That uh, Indigo, I think, is early in your AI journey when you and I spoke about it. And when you see the types of things that, uh, for example, Alibaba is doing, uh, how, as a CEO, how do you get started? What is the plan in terms of the early stages of getting started uh, on your AI journey? So in our case, we've looked at the two areas of our business where we have the most data and where we see the opportunity to use AI to better understand that data to do two things, drive sales and lower cost. And, and when you say lower cost, um, we're talking about improving the flow of product and information from the point of origin to the point of uh, end receipt. Indigo does about a billion one. We handle one way or other about 400,000 SKUs at any time in different places and different, and our ability to manage the uh, purchasing, repurchasing, selection, movement, allocation of those SKUs is just cannot be handled with, uh, cannot be handled effectively or efficiently with our current system. On the other hand, we have about eight, uh, million customers, we have incredible data because of the kind of business we're in, and we have not made good use of data. So we looked at the two places, and we're doing experiments in both those areas. And maybe just because there's a lot of non Canadians in the room, you can give a minute on your business. Okay, so Indigo started, we were books, music, DVD, video, remember when those things uh, existed. Um, we no sooner got into one business than it was obviated. Etc. Etc. Um, so when books went uh, digital, uh, we co-founded Kobo, which was a digital e-reading company. But we realized while we had a rocket ship on our hands, we could never compete with um, Apple and Amazon in that technology area. We sold that to Rakuten, and then we had to take our core book business and reinvent. We think of ourselves now as a book lovers lifestyle store uh, for adults, and we are also in the kids' business. So. Uh, to understand Indigo, if you've never lived here, you have to take yourself over to Bay and Bloor, which is about two blocks from here. You will see the beginning of the transformation. It is a really wonderful experience, but we are we will never make it. We will never make it if we can't uh, uh, find a way to efficiently leverage AI. We will never make it. And for both, this is a little bit from both you and Heather. When you see uh, so Kai Fu Lee recently published his book on AI superpowers, and in his book, he describes uh, some of the ways in which China is so far ahead of the rest of the world, including the U.S. Um, when you see Michael's presentation, you hear the things that he's doing. Uh, as leaders of your organizations, what, is the, what are the questions that you have for Michael? Uh, and I was using, like, what's the first order question in terms of uh, seeing their, their deployment uh, and how far ahead they seem from uh, even, even uh, Amazon. Uh, what are the what are the first order questions you have in terms of leadership with organizations like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it, uh, the warehouse, the picture of the warehouse was uh, fantastic. And seeing the AGVs of all uh, makes and sizes in there uh, interacting, they've obviously uh, leapfrogged ahead of you know. The What's, what's easy, sort of easily available out there. So uh, I thought that was very interesting from this factory of the future concept that we have of trying to, to work with, uh, with you know, less people, more uh, automation to be more efficient and effective in what we do on the shop floor. The real question is, how can companies which are relatively small in size afford to implement. So what can we leverage? How can we access it? Can we be data customers? Hi, Mike. Is that me? Hi. It's very unfair what you're doing, Audrey. 
Um, you're supposed to be asking the questions. Um, let me make a couple comments on this. The affordability is something that I touched on just at the end of my remarks. I actually touched on it once or twice within the remarks. You know that on our platform are 11 million small businesses. We do not have multinational corporations on our platform. We have brands that are selling products, but not the big multinational corporations. And why is that? It's because our view is, and this is Jack's view, but I actually subscribe to it, which is that for the last 50, 60 years, 60,000 multinational corporations around the world have controlled global trade. And don't confuse that with what's going on between China and the U.S. right now. And for the next 50 years, we believe that 40 million SMEs will have their opportunity connected through the internet with secure payments and smart logistics to trade their products to consumers and small businesses all over the world. So one of the reasons that we're so focused on AI, and first of all, making sure it will work at scale in our own business, is you heard me mention the fact that we have to develop chips and computing power and get the cost of AI down so that we can provide that service to SMEs and allow them to be beneficiaries, not just in China, but all over the world. So give you a tangible example of this. We're working with another company in a very large company, a country with a very large population, who's extremely interested in the end-to-end -end automated logistics driven by AI. Because they want to set up a national warehouse system, because they're also a very, very big retail player. And they want to use our technology, and we're going to let them use our technology, because it's not proprietary to us. It's what will service the largest number of SMEs and begin this process of what Mark Kearney described, integrating them into the real economy. The real economy that we have today is not the real economy. It's missing 70% of what drives the real economy, which are the small businesses around the world. And if you want to react to it. Uh, well, no, only to say um, we need you. I'm here. <laughs> Very quickly, um, reinforce what uh, Mike just said um, uh, in a couple of ways. So, uh, first off, uh, the scale of the opportunity is huge. Secondly, if you want inclusive growth, um, you have to have SMEs. Um, that spreads it across regions, across areas. Uh, if, you, if you want inclusive growth, you need services uh, as well. Uh, that spreads it uh, in a much uh, uh, better gender balance, in fact, more women in services than, uh, um, than in manufacturing relative terms. Um, so you have to do that. In order to do it, you need AI for the lending decision, I think. And then you also need to do a lot of plumbing things, which enable that. I referenced uh, the Know Your Customer stuff, hugely important if you're going to have global trade that way. But also, you just need to get the cost of cross-border payments down dramatically. And so when we think about that end state, they're starting from the client, like, like starting from the client. Uh, as a central bank, we think, okay, what do we do to the plumbing to make it seamless? And I reference, you know, from Saskatoon to Shanghai. That should be, you know, the, the firms would be almost as indifferent from Saskatoon to Shanghai as to uh, uh, Saskatoon to Toronto. And, and the plumbing can get there, and the credit decision can get there, and that's one of the huge opportunities. Of but it will be very different by geography because if you look at the Chinese environment, obviously the regulatory hurdles as you go from the client, the customer, all the way to the consumer are completely different. The payments authorities are very different. These are horizontal platforms with a massive ability to move data with relatively less hurdles in doing so than we see in the West. And I think one of the key questions is how the regulation of all of this is going to evolve because it will have an impact. China has three massive platform players, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. They're very different. I'm not trying to say they're the same, but they have benefited from a different regulation model. And so I think one of the intriguing questions we're going to have is how is all of this going to be impl impacted by the attitude of society and governments towards what's going on? Because in essence, I think we can all agree on the SAD point, we can all agree on the customer, but I think we'll have quite different views on the extent to which you want different players controlling that access to information. Okay, my next question actually is for you, which is, there's a number of CEOs in the room today uh, from banks, telecoms, manufacturing companies, as well as the ones that are here on the stage. For those that are early in their AI journey, uh, and your firm, as well as your competitors, provide you know, help 
large corporations get going, get started. Uh, so on, in practical terms, in terms of just blocking and tackling, uh, when you land on the ground with the client uh, for an engagement, let's say the first three months of getting started in their AI transformation, what are the, the first things you do to get started? Pick the place where you're going to get a use case that works. You've got to get some use cases, you've got to get some examples that actually show this is for real. That's what's so powerful about CNO and the example of the warehouse. It's for real. You sort of get it. When these examples are real, you know, this is actual stuff that's happening on the shop floor. I think I worry sometimes people pick stuff that's off at the periphery. And they engage a third party to go and do it. And so it's often pilot purgatory. It's just out there. It's something you can wave to the analysts and show you're doing, as opposed to in the heart of the business. What is it that's actually going to be material to that business? Is it a payments decision? Is it a next product to buy decision? Is it the shop floor efficiencies and productive maintenance? But pick some places where there's going to be an example that will ultimately resonate with both your colleagues who have to make decisions and then build on the momentum, hopefully a successful initiative outing will take, or it's going to be your customers that can actually see something. But I think it's important not to do this pilot purgatory where you're off to the side. It was a moment in time when I think people look quite into that. We'll just spin out something. No, this is about the heart of the business. So you need to pick something that's at the heart of the business that you can actually demonstrate this is for real and it works. And you're the captain of the your ship that resonates with you. A hundred percent, actually. I think that's amazing advice. Um, you took that advice. We were also given that advice, and that's why we went to the two areas, richest in data and most strategic to three aspects of the business. Uh, ability to serve customers with what they want, uh, improving quality of work for people because they're trying to deal with crazy amounts of data with horribly outdated systems, and the result is lower cost. Okay. So uh, we did it. We, we have one POC in the customer side. We have one POC in the planning, forecasting, and allocation side. Um, and then I'm hoping we can get a giant one going with Mike. I have a crush on Mike. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Barney, welcome to Memo, back to Toronto. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, I've been really enjoying this, uh, this day and, uh, and all the speakers. Um, there's lots of questions, but I think one thing I haven't heard that much about is change management. And, you know, when I've seen uh, big companies and small companies try to adopt AI, um, it all sounds great, even at the top CEO level, until someone has to actually change what they do um, and then the people to want to. So I'm wondering well, what you guys can say on this topic of change management and adopting AI in businesses. Yeah, uh, I can talk a little bit to that. I think uh, for to be successful in that, you need to have a culture in your organization that is comfortable with change. And that's easy to say and I think a little harder to do. Uh, but it is, it's something that we, we've actually uh, managed to achieve. And I think a big part of it is really being dedicated in the organization to continuous improvement every day. Uh, and not by the lean department, but by every single person in the organization. So, you know, as just one example, we have a target of six implemented ideas for improvement per person per year. And what that does is we make everybody think, I, I have a job to play here in terms of improvement and making change and driving change, which is great in terms of driving improvements, but it also has a sort of corollary effect of making people comfortable with change because we're constantly changing in small ways, big ways, but we're constantly evolving and we're encouraging that to happen at every with every single individual in the organization. And I think that's really important because if you can be comfortable, if you are driving change personally at every single level, then you're comfortable with, you're more comfortable with it. I mean, it's never, change is never that comfortable, but you're more comfortable with it if you feel like you're doing it every single day. So uh, that's like one idea on how to create that culture of change, but that's, you know, you just, you need to get people comfortable with the idea of doing that, and then I think they become more comfortable. And I think also if they can see a positive outcome for themselves, so I showed you those charts in the way our workforce is changing, more indirect, better paying jobs, more interesting jobs. You know, if we were implementing lean or AI and a bunch of people were losing their jobs, there'd be a lot less buy-in. 
uh, to the whole idea. But if, in fact, you're, what you're eliminating is the, the painful jobs, like visual inspection at the end of the line, I mean, it's a, it's a terrible job. Nobody likes it. Turnover's enormous. So, you know, eliminating those jobs, people are actually pretty happy about that and getting into something that's a little more interesting. Uh, so, you know, if there's, there's got to be some upside to them, I think. Okay, we're going to keep moving our questions. So, uh, Mara? That's actually a perfect transition. I'm over here. Um, my question is going to try to connect, Linda, your uh, couple things you said with a couple things uh, Mark Carney said. So, I was most surprised by that slide you were just referencing where you showed that jobs were increasing, in particular indirect jobs, and jobs were increasing uh, with higher pay and they were more interesting jobs. And had you overlaid adoption of AI and other technologies to show that these things were positively correlated, I think would have been really interesting. Uh, at the same time, you talked about the sort of general macro view that technologies come, they destroy certain jobs, and they eventually create a new set of higher paying jobs. So I guess my question is, uh, were you surprised at the, the speed at which this seems to be happening in, in Linda's firm, um, and that it was happening in manufacturing, and how can, uh, maybe Linda, you can speak to why this happened, but also how can the, the broad policies and institutions that you talk about to sort of transition the labor market be informed by what's going on inside specific firms? I mean, I, I, I don't think the exception proves the rule. I, I, I think the macro uh, impact is, is very likely uh, to be that there are large numbers of roles displaced. Uh, I mean, uh, the complementarities of the skills that you know, you know, your employees have and that, you, uh, that they're used to changing and upgrading and continuously upgrading is more of an exception uh, than, uh, than the rule. Um, and that um, the, the, I, I won't repeat the broader societal things that I think we do need to do. Um, in order to ease with the transition, because most of the transitions will not happen in firm. They will happen, you know, displaced from firm and then ultimately. And then the challenge, I'll finish on this, is that, um, you know, skills atrophy very quickly and, and labor force attachment tends to atrophy very quickly. Um, I, I would just add to that that uh, I don't think we're necessarily an exception. I think that what's happening at Linamar is what's happening in a lot of manufacturing companies that I know right here in Canada. They're going through a very similar transition. So uh, maybe it's a little bit sectorally uh, fo focused that where the opportunities and where uh, you know companies are able to to take advantage of, of this technology in a positive uh, way. Manufacturing is 100% uh, one of them. There may be other industries out there where, uh, you know, that, that is not the case. And, you know, so it, it may not happen every in every industry and in every sector, but it's 100% happening uh, in, in manufacturing organizations. Can we have time for just one more question? Suzanne, and you get the final question. Okay. All right. Uh, so then I'm going to uh, just ask the, the last question, uh, which is, uh, for Michael, what is the, for the Canadians and Americans that are here, uh, that in your view, when you and I first began talking on this topic in the summer, uh, your comment to me was, people will be surprised, Americans will be surprised when they really understand what's happening uh, in China and with Alibaba in particular in terms of how advanced you are. What, is, what do you think we will find is the most shocking, uh, either now or the, or the next 24 months, in terms of how uh, retail and the, you know, the consumer relationship to retail is, is advanced in your sector relative to what we're used to here? Uh, well, hopefully nothing shocking, um, but I think surprising, uh, lots of things. I do believe that, and look, I grew up in Canada, or at least for a while, and, and was heavily influenced by everything that I saw in the United States, and was led to believe for a long, long time that all of the greatest technology was produced on the west coast of, of the United States. And having lived all over the world, um, and particularly in China, I realized there are many great things going on there in technology much of which was the product of Chinese people who were educated in the United States. But the real question is, in the same way that an Alipay, which is electronic payments, by the way, I think payments will be for free in the future, 
this, this notion of paying two and a half to three percent, sorry if these are Mr. Carter American Express are in the room, but I, I just believe that payments, electronic payments, where is the cost? If the cost is embedded in the system today, it needs to be extracted from the system. So I think that what you're going to see is the real application of all of these technologies, not just in China, and there might be some differences of opinion on the regulatory framework for things like Alipay or Cloud, but you're going to see the use of those technologies in countries outside of China. And they will be for the benefit of not the big guys, but for the small guys. And I think that people will scratch their head and say, there must be another angle, is the Chinese coming, you know, we should be careful of this. But I think they'll eventually get to the right place, which is understanding these are technologies for everybody, not for a few. They can benefit everybody, not just a few. It's not about Alibaba. It's about the many. And that's the contribution we want to make to the global community, to the global inclusive finance and the global economy. And I think you're going to see more of that over the next 12 months than you've seen over the last five years. All right, well, for many people in this room, their lives uh, revolving around AI, and for a lot of people working in the this is their, their primary uh, focus area. For you, you're all playing leadership roles in large organizations, uh, and this is just a tiny slice of what you're working on. Uh, but I think all the reason I invited each of you is because you each have a view uh, on the role of, of AI and the importance it's playing in your organizations. So thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it.